Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish of the people. And we're here at the Rat House because I expect that for the next hour or so we will hear an absolutely spirited and productive uh, discussion around the uh, area of transportation. This event is organized by KCTS and the Community Advisory Board of KCTS. And you may be wondering if you watch TV, and I'm sure all of you do, and if you do, you should watch KCTS. Why is the Seattle Television Station doing this in Vancouver? Well, half of KCTS's viewers actually come from the Lower Mainland of British Columbia. And KCTS really believes that it needs to be part of the community uh, with where it serves, uh, sort of where its uh, viewers are. And of course, having a tremendous service out here in the Lower Mainland and BC means that we are part of the community. So KCTS is um, really happy to be here hosting this community forum. The, the event here is, is hosted by the Community Advisory Board, of which there are about a dozen across uh, Washington State and British Columbia. And, can't hear me? Okay, there's that bit. And I'm, I'm really pleased that we do have a number of our, our Canadian Advisory Board members here with us today. So I'm going to um, uh, acknowledge that we have uh, Kevin Lynn. Kevin from Wave is over here and to my right. We have Anne-Marie Decker with Kevin, and we also have Suzanne Green here uh, this evening. So thank you all for all your work in putting this event together. We also have, uh, have had tremendous support from the staff of KCTS, uh, Kelsey Tomaszewski, Bill Kite, Megan Herb, and Dan Barkley have been uh, really uh, helpful in helping putting this event together. We also have Enrique Sirenas, who I uh, will introduce in a few minutes, who's moderating, and I'll do it in, in a more proper way. Um, this event could have been possible with, and of course, the fact that you're here, uh, not only um, was that a result of outreach by KCTS, but by a number of organizations here in the Lower Mainland that we were able to partner with. Uh, the Board of Changes one, I happen to also be the chair of the Board of Change, so that may have been a bit of an inside job. <laughs> we also have um, PUP, um, the Cycling Coalition, who is a tremendous uh, partner in helping to pr promote this to their membership as well. Um, as you came in this evening, you did see that there were a number of exhibitors there um, showing you some of the alternative transportation methods that you could be involved with. Uh, we had Electromechanica, Velo Metro, Moto, and own electric bikes, and of course, hub. But you're really here to, to learn about uh, what are the transportation options that we have here in the Lower Mainland. Uh, when we as the Community Advisory Board decided that transportation was going to be the topic that we focus on, it really was a bit of a blip on the map. Everybody was talking about housing, and we're really pleased that we were perhaps a little patient because as soon as we decided that that was the topic we were gonna focus on, um, more information came out and um, the discussion began to, to heat up. So we're really pleased that we were able to bring this particular topic to you here uh, this evening. And we're really, really grateful that you all came out to join us for this. But our event tonight is hosted by Enrique Serna. Uh, Enrique is the Director of Community Partnerships at KCTS. He joined the station in January 1995 and he's anchored current affairs programs, moderated statewide political debates, and produced reporters and reporter stories for national PBS programs, as well as local documentaries in a wide variety of topics. If you watch KCTS, you may recognize him. Um, Enrique has, uh, is an award-winning uh, um, uh, host as well. He's earned nine Northwest Emmy Awards. And in June 2013, he was inducted into the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences Northwest Chapter Silver Circle for his work as a television professional. So, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> moderators. Thank you, Sunny. Thank you all for turning out tonight. Uh, this is a great turnout, and I think it also goes to show by uh, the great work of our KCTSI Community Advisory Board, our Vancouver uh, British Columbia contingent that did such great work in trying to uh, put together this community forum, important community forum, that uh, uh, we are just so pleased that you are here this evening to be a part of. A uh, couple of things, uh, if you have cell phones, I'm going to ask you maybe to turn them off just so that we don't have any interruptions. Uh, beyond that, uh, we, we hope to have a really good conversation this evening. Now, uh, 
We can relate down in Seattle about traffic because we have a few traffic issues ourselves. In fact, uh, we have a lot of traffic issues. And in many ways, they are very similar to what is uh, happening in the Metro Vancouver area. So uh, I look very, very much forward to this conversation to hear about what's happening here, but also uh, to also hear about what hopefully might be uh, solutions to what some of the challenges that you're facing here. So we've put together a great panel this evening, and let me introduce them now. Uh, over on my uh, left here, to go down the road, is the uh, mayor of Port Coquitlam, and that is Greg Moore. He's also the chair of Metro Vancouver. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it very much. Uh, also next to him is Erin O'Mellon. She is the executive director of Upcycling. Jeff Cross, vice president of planning and policy of TransLink. And Andy Yan, director of city programs, Simon Fraser University. He's also an urban planner. Uh, he has lots of charts, he tells me. But uh, we'll hear about that tonight. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Now, besides their insights on all of this, I want to hear from you tonight. Uh, we do want to open it up for uh, questions and comments. Uh, I will do my best to get around to you, so when we get to that part, if you raise your hand, and I will come to you. And uh, I only ask that you don't try to take the mic away from me. We share the mic together, okay? So uh, let's uh, work you into the conversation. Very much want you to be a part of this. So, uh, well, Mr. Ryan, we'll start with you first. Uh, it's something I want to pose to all of you. And this, give me this little headline here of uh, the transportation challenges that you see that in your work and in what you do. Thanks, and thanks for putting this on. This is a, a wonderful opportunity to have this discussion uh, that's so important to all of us in our daily life. It doesn't matter if you're a commuter or a student or a senior. This uh, You have to get around this region, whether it's by walking, biking, transit, driving. Um, so, you know, we always start with the what's the biggest challenge, and let me start with the other side of that. You know, I, we, I think we need to pat ourselves on the back every once in a while and talk about the good things that we've done. So we have a regional growth strategy. We've actually had regional growth strategies in this region for decades now. Uh, to talk about how we're, because you know, we're 22 local governments, about how we're working together on land use planning. But then we, uh, then we take on top of that, we put the, tra or we integrate into that transportation planning. And uh, three years ago, I guess now, that we came up with a 10 year mayor's uh, transportation vision and plan. Uh, that was integrating the regional planning, the local planning, and figuring out what we needed to do to get people around this region. So I think, you know, actually I know when we were lobbying the federal government to put money into the transit plan, and when the, the new government uh, was formed and they were out talking about their phase one funding, they held our 10-year plan and our regional growth strategy as a model to the rest of the cities across Canada and said, this is what we're looking for. We're not looking for a plan that has one transit line. We're looking for an integrated plan that affects the region and how that works, whether it's the region of Toronto or Calgary or wherever it is. The challenge, I think, that one of the biggest challenges that we have is just around funding. Right? You know, we all live the nightmare of a referendum up here, and I know we in, uh, in the states do that more often, but that was the first time, I think, in Canadian history that we had to do a referendum uh, to get funding for a fundamental part of growing a region of transportation. And, you know, um, we don't have to live that nightmare again, but it wasn't successful. Uh, and so that funding mechanism, uh, and as the mayors, I'll say, we really don't have an issue putting our hand up to fund the projects. We just don't have any tools in our toolbox to be able to do that, with the exception of one. And so we really need to work on that partnership with the provincial and federal level. And I think we're now turning that corner that that partnership is is starting to come together. So I think that's our challenge, but I think there's great opportunities for us to go forward here. Karen. So I'm going to talk a lot about bicycling tonight, but I want to start out by saying obviously not every trip is a bike trip and so we want there to be options and we do have some amazing options already here in Metro Vancouver and as the population grows and expands into the outlying areas it's really important that we keep up with that so I'm really looking forward to translating and the Mayor's Council and what they're working on right now hopefully going through to be able to fund public transportation properly cycling and walking properly and of course motor vehicles still need to get around 
So those options of car sharing are included in that. We're seeing bike sharing come in now. I think having more options allows us to use them for the appropriate type of trip and then frees up road space and other types of space, like congested transit space, for the appropriate types of trips so we can all move around easier as there are more and more of us. But back to cycling. I think that's a huge part of the solution. Over two thirds of the trips in Metro Vancouver are under eight kilometers, which is a very bikeable distance. And sometimes the barriers are a disconnected network where our campaign like Ungap the Map talks about connecting that so that a huge potential, the 25% of people that are already biking would bike more, and the 40% of people that are interested in biking would start to do so. There's lots of potential there. Uh, we need to make sure that there's a safe and direct way for people to actually get from one part of the region to the other. So creating that base is something that needs to happen now, and then we'll start seeing the benefits of that. And then, of course, there's all of the affordability components that come along with that, space efficiency, moving more people, less space, less money to build it and maintain it. Uh, people are healthier. So there's lots of benefits, and I know you guys are very of that, and it's just how do we move people past either real barriers or perceived barriers to be able to get there. I'm really happy to see things evolving like public bike share and a lot of even the other modes like <coughs> car sharing now have bike racks on them. So you're going to bike a part of the trip and you're going to put it on the car or it's super rainy in the middle of the day. You don't have to bike all the way home. You've got options. Um, and then other exciting things like being able to move around the whole region, even longer distances, and cycling highways are something exciting that are happening in a lot of places in the world. And we would love to see that here. If you've ever been to Victoria and ridden the Galloping Goose, it's a good local example, and it's very possible here. So I hope to work together with the provincial government in particular because they're responsible for a lot of our highways on moving that forward so that we're not just making small change, but really capturing that. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Enrique, for having uh, me. For one thing, uh, one of the challenges we used to have is that I don't think anybody in the lower mainland thought that TransLink actually had a planning division. Uh, so after the referendum and the... You're here to prove it. We'll prove, prove this. Right? I, know, I think people are now aware we have it. Uh, for better or worse, in some people's opinions. But um, building on Mayor Moore's points, certainly funding has been a, a key issue for us. Um, I had closer to hair like Aaron than Mayor Moore when I started <laughs> the funding discussion eight years ago. So uh, working on sustainable funding. Um, but Mayor Moore is correct in that we have a really great land use plan and the region is growing really quickly and it's creating a much more urban region. Uh, the challenge for us is to play catch up. It's been uh, since 2009, since we rolled out any major investments, Evergreen's about to come out, but in that time, uh, the region's added 250,000 people, uh, the size of Burnaby, and we have not expanded transit options. We have not necessarily kept pace with the cycling options and integrating all of our transportation planning. Uh, and during that period, in the last couple of years, uh, car prices have gone down, fuel has stabilized, so driving is more attractive to people. So finding really good options that are attractive and not punitive is, is the challenge for us. And well, thank you, Enrique. I, I guess I want to thank you, KCPS, to uh, have this event. Uh, I, I, as a child of KCPS, have grown from Sesame Street and Reading Rainbow to Red Dwarf. So <laughs> really, I think part of this is kind of what would the headline be into the future. I think it's it's really around, I was trying to think of maybe do a haiku. And I think the haiku is going something about affordability, mobility, and region. That very much it's a discussion about affordability and knowing that there are significant, uh, very real affordability issues in dealing with housing for uh, for, e for any local worker in the re in, 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 in metropolitan Vancouver. But then connected to that is actually how important mobility is towards that issue of affordability. And I think it's mobility not only in the sense of physical mobility, but it's also to understand the nuances and the importance of transit to various groups and populations. I think whether you're a young worker or a newcomer to Canada, that if there are actually very significant and important elements in the role of public transportation in particular, um, and, and, and overall um, 
um, a sustainable means of transportation overall to, uh, to mobility in the term of a social and economic sense. And I think the third is really important, is really a uh, discussion and its regional basis. And actually, I think it's also talking about in a regional basis towards the successes that we actually have had as a region. Uh, on, uh, as I was talking about in, um, to, to the group here earlier, was that really when we think about metropolitan Vancouver and all the cities on the west coast of Canada, the, uh, Canada and the United States, we actually have the highest proportion of workers, 20% of all workers in metropolitan Vancouver actually take transit to work. And as a relative example, uh, in Seattle, it's 8%. So you, you actually, I think, have this opportunity to kind of create and actually have a culture of mass transit, of public transportation, of tra a sustainable transportation that I think we can really be proud of. But yet, I think within that pride, I think it's also the understanding that uh, of change and the opportunity, I think, in the face of economic change, but also in the face of climate change, that that's really why we need to think about how we need to be moved around in this region. Give me an idea of, of what do you think is, I guess, the what, what an ideal infrastructure, a good-looking infrastructure would look like in trying to make things work together and mesh together. I think the, the bottom line with, with most things, and I think transit or transportation movement is the same, is it has to be convenient, right? If you're out in the burbs and your bus comes every half hour and once an hour in the evenings, that's not convenient. And you're not, like I take the bus home tonight, I'm gonna go to bed after this, I'm gonna get on the SkyTrain, I'm gonna get to Bray Station, and I sure hope I hit one of the two buses that gets me home, because they're an hour if I miss it, right? That's just, people aren't gonna do that. So the convenience of taking a transit system or the safety and convenience of cycling or walking uh, has to be paramount in transforming how people will use the system. You can look at whether it's the SkyTrain or West Coast Express. West Coast Express is a great idea, that example. Really convenient to take it. Uh, and it's packed, right? It's, for all of you folks that are in Vancouver, uh, it's standing room only after at least Port Coquitlam. So when you get on in Coquitlam and in Port Moody, you're standing for the ride. And so that just is an example of a good, convenient, quality system, and it's being used by sort of your untraditional transit users. And from that standpoint, then how do you make service be on time to make sure this guy gets where he needs to go, or anybody <laughs> else there? Yeah. <laughs> I hear this from Mayor Moore at every meeting. Um, no, one of the things, obviously, is, is matching supply to demand, but there's insatiable demand in this region. It's a good problem to have. Uh, but even under the most productive corridors, be it the 99B line or 97B line, buses do not recover you know, the majority of their costs. Uh, the B line is about the closest. So every time we add service, it requires more funding. But, you know, I think that the mayors have identified a really good plan to be able to improve that frequency to better match where the demand is going. And, and Coquitlam and Port Coquitlam are great examples that they're densifying around the corridors where we can then justify putting in more service and it's this positive feedback loop. And so, as I said, it's been a while since we've been able to catch up uh, to be able to uh, sorry, match that demand, but I think we're in a better place to do it. I'd say the other piece um, to your original question, what can we do, what would it look like to be better is sort of integrated information and payment so so that when, when Mayor Moore starts his trip, he knows exactly what his options are gonna be and that he has resilient options. So when he gets there at parade, uh, maybe he has a bike share if he missed that, that uh, last bus by 15 minutes or something like that. My commute here from the work at, from work at out in New Westminster. Uh, to get here tonight, I, I took the SkyTrain to Main Street, and then I looked, I missed the shuttle, so I jumped on the public bike share, the bike over here. So having that information, I looked at, looked at the travel planner, and I knew my transit options, but I didn't yet know all, the, the, all those other options. That would be a huge improvement, and we need to focus more energy. Andy, you want to wait? I think one of the interesting paradigm shifts, I think, as we move forward is actually, I think, the fundamental shift of transportation as a service as opposed to stuff. That for a long time, we always attributed transportation as stuff, as a car. And I think fundamentally, as we change, we, 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 and I think what was exciting, actually, was hearing from the CEO of Translink talking about how it's, a, it's an overall kind of collection of services that, that are focused on transportation, of how you get from 
A to B, which could be on any number of means of getting there, as opposed to owning a car. And I think that that's really one of the exciting kind of disruptions that have occurred in, in the face of technology, in the face of just, I think, changing ideas of how do I get to where I need to go, that I think we, we can really take advantage of it at this moment. Third, for you, where does the bike fit in? Uh, well, integration, I mean, I think Jeff started to talk about what I would add to is um, having your compass card and then uh, maybe you don't live in an area that has great transit, uh, but you want to get to a SkyTrain station, you can bike there, it might be your fastest mode, and then if you can take that compass card, swipe into the secure bike parking, and then hop on board, that's great. And then using that same card for bike share on the other end. Um, so having that integration, making sure it's convenient, making sure it's obvious, I think a lot of people just do what they habitually do and they're not aware of all of the options. So some kind of awareness campaigns also fit in. It's not just about physical infrastructure and systems, it's about educating and raising awareness. I want to uh, note that uh, I was looking at some studies and, and reports and studies and about congestion and how it's bad for our health, uh, everybody's health, because it uh, raises your blood pressure. Uh, it does that for a lot of people. Uh, it's just bad period for the, the stress that it puts on everybody. Uh, but one of the things that was suggested, I believe by a national commission, was some type of congestion pricing. What do you think of that? So we've talked about it here in the region, we, you know, whether we call it mobility pricing or road tolling or congestion pricing. Um, we think, that, and I say when I say we, the Mayor's Council, uh, we actually put it into our 10-year vision as the second phase of funding for the plan was to introduce mobility pricing. Uh, so that you pay for the road system just like you pay for a transit system uh, when you get onto it. It's not a freeway, like it's free. Um, and so, but you can use that not only as a revenue tool, but you can also use it as a policy tool. Uh, if you want to try to, I always use this as a, as a simple example, if you want to encourage the trucking industry to use the roads when nobody else is on, them, let them use the roads free from midnight to 5 a.m. And then when we're trying to get everybody to work, you know, from 5.30 to 9.30, they're going to pay three or four times the amount. Um, just simple things like that will start to use a financial lever to deal with congestion, to deal with air quality and other things. And I think there's some... Uh, there's some good evidence in Portland and other places in the world where they're starting to do that, whether it's a toll-based system every time you go over a bridge or it's a GPS in your car or whatever it is. Um, and, and we're going to start to have, in this region, some very serious conversations about what that looks like. Uh, because if you're going to bring on, if we're going to replace the uh, Patella Bridge and the provincial government um, apparently is going to do whatever it takes to replace the George Massey Tunnel, uh, and they're all going to come on around 2000. 21, 2022, it makes sense then to revamp the whole system if you're going to bring two new tolls in. So I think that's kind of the time frame that we're working on as well. I think, right. One thing I wanted to add, so when the mayors put together the vision and we were supporting them in that, we said the investments are necessary, but they don't really change the dial without getting the pricing right. And Mayor Moore pointed out that we do that on transit. I think we can do a better job. That's a discussion we're having right now in coming up with a new fare policy and taking advantage of our new smart card system to be able to work on the same sort of time of day in incentives for people to be able to do that. So when we looked at it, we said basically one third of the uh, improvements that we could get to mode share and reducing driving would come from the actual investments and two thirds would be from getting the pricing right. And that's not necessarily pricing more, that is pricing more at the times of the day when it's expensive for that marginal trip. Andy, you want to weigh in on this at all? Well, I think one of the most important elements, I think, that is a challenge for any form of mobility pricing is to make sure that there is a certain uh, social equity, that there is an element that is progressive in terms of how do you deal with the issue of affordability and how do you deal with, um, I think, groups which are seeing their geographies transform as, as we speak at this very moment, that you see greater amounts of low-income households as well as immigrants, new immigrants in Canada, as well as refugees, and even further and further places away from not only the downtown and central <coughs> cities of Vancouver, but the, 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 the employment centers. And I think that that's really where a considered approach to think about transportation and its means of getting people to work, I think, that is coming to play. And I think that's a big challenge. But as we go with that, and I don't disagree with what you're saying, um, 
when you put together your transportation costs and your housing costs, when you go live outside of the urban area, you're paying more for those things than if you just bit the bullet and got rid of your car and paid more for your condo next to the SkyTrain station. But I think cities have a role to play in ensuring that those 40 and 50 year old wood frame, three story, very low um, barrier entry rentals that are now getting uh, transformed into shiny high rises, that there isn't a net loss of that rental stock, affordable rental stock within that transit hub because that's where we can really start to uh, address this affordability issue. And a really important plug for some of the work that Metro Vancouver is doing. If there is a report you ought to read this year, it's the H plus T report that the Metro Vancouver had published in the FDR update that really talks about the discussion of when you connect transportation and housing together. That very much there is actually, I think, a facade, a illusion that really, really cheap housing is really that cheap, especially once you uh, once you start adding in transportation costs. And I think that that's a really important element that I think that um, certainly a part of the conversation Metropolitan Vancouver is bringing in, talking about location efficiency, talking about the real cost of these types of transportation costs, and really, I think, uh, incentivizing um, the right solutions. Erin, you want to weigh in? Yeah, I think it's really important to start externalizing the cost, making them very explicit, because we're making decisions sometimes based on part of the story. So a lot of people are looking at the house price and they're saying, well, I'm going to move way out here because I can afford it. And they're not factoring in the full transportation costs, as well as their time costs and what impact that has on their quality of life. So I think once you introduce mobility pricing, people see, oh, I do have to pay for this. And right now it's all hidden in taxes that are kind of smushed together. And we get it a lot on the biking side because people say, well, you bikers, you don't pay for any of your infrastructure. That is not true. We pay for it through property and other types of taxes, and our infrastructure as a cyclist costs far less than it does for all of the big motor vehicle stuff. I think you can go like millions of trips on a bike um, compared to one trip with a big uh, truck in terms of the wear and tear on the roads. But people don't understand where the revenue is coming from and where it's going to and how expensive it really is to move around in private vehicles. So the more we can get that out there, and I think the more equitably we can do that around the region, because if you don't have to cross the bridge, you are still using the transportation infrastructure, um, the better people will make decisions. So I think affordability needs to be viewed in that bigger picture, and we need to be taking into account transportation, which can be up to a third of people's income being spent on it. Uh, you want to work in the audience here. If you have questions or comments, raise your hand. This fellow got my attention, so here we go. You have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to put some facts together to some of the comments that we're making here tonight. For example, um, I live within a block of Broadway where we have the 99B line, which is an example of a transportation system which is the most deplorable curve design I've ever seen. You know, it turns Broadway into what I euphemistically call an open traffic sewer. Uh, on regional growth strategies, I think if we look at the change in the cost of housing that Andy's talking about, uh, from personal experiences, from 2005 to 2016, 500% increase. If we go back to uh, Expo 86, where the towers and sky trains all got started, increase in the price of housing, 2,244%. Uh, towers and SkyTrain urbanism, or as urbanism, it's creating neighborhoods with no social functioning. Uh, anonymity comes with moving into a tower. And the alternative, which is a neighborhood where you have neighbors on all four sides, is something that we're stopping to consider just about throughout the Lower Mainland, uh, regional growth strategies or not. So any other questions? We have questions. So how do we frame a question from all that? Um, which comes down to how do you make your commute better, I suppose, too. Go ahead. Land use, land use, land use. 
that fundamentally I think it brings in towards a challenge to not only think about transportation by itself, but really how it's connected to land use and the decisions of the kind of complete communities that we need to develop moving, moving forward. And I think that that's really one of the major avenues to really connect on. And I think to really tie in towards this question of land use, and I think this is actually a, a pretty interesting statistic, is that um, something that, that going into thinking about those who take transit, 58% of those are renters. And very much the, this discussion about land use around transit stations may also need to entertain the ideas that you need to engage issues of, 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 of land tenure, of, of housing tenure, I should say. That um, very much the idea of the fact that you should have a certain percentage of rental stock devoted around a house, around a transit station, I think, reflects the kind of realities of those who do take transit. And I, go ahead. I would add that um, obviously we need to do the partnering and the land use. So the way we think about it um, from the guidance from our board and the Mayor's Council is kind of three pillars to uh, partner, uh, manage, and invest, and really to do it in that order so that you make sure that you've got the land use right, that you've got the pricing right, that you've got the right amount of parking, that you're providing uh, information, all those kinds of things, and that you put the investment in there to catch the demand where it's going to be attractive and convenient. And to, I think the question to the gentleman who posed the question, I don't think there's one solution that fits for this region. I think there's still going to be a lot of driving uh, in this region. You know, when we look at the 10-year plan at the end of this, right now we have uh, roughly 27 or 28 percent of trips are made by cycling, walking, or transit. We think that might rise to 35 or 36 percent. That means 64 percent of the trips are still being made by vehicle, and in a lot of places that makes the most sense. You know, and I think it's just trying to find a way to efficiently support those neighborhoods and respond to uh, lowering uh, vehicle costs, as you said, with the fleet electrifying and maybe automating connected vehicles. How do we make sure we do so in a livable uh, approach? Well, I think also, you know, you talked about the regional growth strategy, regional planning, transit planning. Um, you know, we're not in charge of immigration policy, for example. So we have 38,000 people moving to Metro Vancouver every year. And we need to do our best to try to figure out how to accommodate and maintain our livable region. And so I think we're in this, this evolution right now, or this, this, this transition from, you know, when I grew up, my parents had a single family house with a green piece of grass out front and in the back, and that's what they wanted for me. And now that my daughter's 17, uh, turning 18, I, I, I don't think she wants that. I, I'm not sure if I want that for her, like my parents wanted it for me and my parents. So I think we're in this time of change that, you know, if you grew up in New York or San Francisco or Shanghai or Paris, you, you don't have this illusion that you're going to have a, a single family dwelling. And so I think we're in that transition. I think my daughter in that generation would rather forego, to your point, four, four neighbors and live in a condo that's next to a transit line, that's next to great entertainment, and that's where they're gonna go out and entertain and that sort of thing. They're not gonna do it in the family room or the TV room. I think that's changing. And I think it's hard for us uh, in my generation and older that that's why we were brought up as the way to grow up. And I think our kids are now in that transition. I think and, and along with that, it's the struggle just to be able to buy a home, even yeah. if that were the case. And I think it's harder for us to accept than it is our children. Question. A question to, to Mayor, and also to our bike ride. <clears throat> Before I came to Vancouver 54 years ago, I practically grew up on a bicycle in my home city, Copenhagen, Denmark, which, by the way, has become the number one bike capital in the world. But we're talking about half an hour service, one hour service in the outer district. So if you live out in Delta or Aldebro, way out there, and we have a lot of distance suburbia here, if we're going to have a bus every 15 minutes, I'm all for it but it will cost a fortune. And what about bike lanes out in those areas? Unless we have bike lanes on, on the major highways, uh, not the freeway, but the major highways, people are not going to dare. So what's the solution in those areas? Thank you. Can they coexist? Yeah, thank you. I, I completely agree with you. I think we're, I think it, we're at this point, and Aaron talks about it a lot, and you'll probably want to answer this as well. Uh, I think that's a huge, huge uh, piece to how we go forward. You know, I try to live my life that way. I have this little rule of thumb. If it's, if it's a 10 minute, if, it's, if I can walk there in 10 minutes, I'll walk there. If it takes more than 10 minutes, I'll ride my bike. And if I have to leave the Tri-Cities, because I'm from Poco, I take transit, right? So that's kind of how I think about it. Now, our cycling infrastructure 
isn't the best. It, it, we need to do massive improvements to our cycling, as well as our walking infrastructure. In the mayor's 10-year plan, we ensured that we had uh, large sums of money in each of those, walking and cycling, so that we could partner with the provincial government and local government, so we all brought in our share of funding that to transform that. Like in Poco, the Evergreen Line is about to open up. Uh, I think that's going to be transformational for our cycling community because if they can ride their bike, to your point, from their home, it's going to be sorry, Jeff, it's going to be faster than transit, it's going to be faster than a car uh, to an Evergreen Line station and then lock it up nice and secure and jump on the Evergreen Line. Uh, I think that is absolutely transformational for our Tri-City region. Thank you for bringing up the suburban cycling issue. And as I mentioned, cycling highways are a really great idea. We're seeing them happen in a lot of other places. We haven't quite caught on in Metro Vancouver yet, although the Central Valley Greenway is a little bit of a preview and it's very highly used. It goes all the way from Westminster into Vancouver. So I think we can definitely do this. It's much cheaper and more efficient in providing transit to those low density areas that you're talking about, that it just doesn't make financial sense to provide that there. And it's very fast. There's no waiting involved at the bus stop. You get straight from door to door. And I think particularly with the uh, growth in electric bikes, electric assist bicycles, they're going to be able to cover longer distances in a shorter amount of time. They're getting more affordable all the time. So I think you'll start to see that really ramp up. And so these types of cycling highways would be very beneficial. Yeah. Okay. Well, I have the <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mayor, Mayor Moore, I think I think you answered your question initially as to you know when you as to in terms of where you're coming from as far as the, the, the terrible defeat of the trans transportation initiative. I think in fact that was the voice of the people saying, at least the majority saying, you know, we don't like the idea that we're growing like we are. We don't like the alternatives that have been proposed. Now, Andy, you mentioned land use planning. I served for eight years on the Whatcom County Planning Commission. I'm a dual citizen. I lived in Vancouver most of that time, but I have lived in Whatcom County. We have dealt with the same things on a smaller scale in Bellingham and in Whatcom County. But the principle that we tried to work around in terms of transportation planning and population planning, infrastructure planning, was a term concurrency. You're familiar with that, I'm sure. Concurrency is if you're going to build a high rise building in a shopping center and you're serviced by a certain number of roads now in a much lower density area, you have to have those services coming online at the same time that things are built. And in Vancouver, that's the problem. You've overbuilt Vancouver, and you do not have the infrastructure to service it, and now it's a big problem. To get to the North Shore, you have to cross one of two bridges, neither of which have added one lane since 1958. You've got a much, much larger population competing for the same roads. And the fact that Vancouver has the worst traffic in Canada, and the fact that Seattle is probably not too far behind either, is certainly, you know, it's certainly nothing to be proud of. You have to plan it. If that means down zoning, if it means honoring the agricultural land reserve, if it means you know looking at all of these methods to slow growth, because we <clears throat> everybody in the world would like to live in Vancouver, but unfortunately we can't accommodate all of them. But if that's what politicians have to do, they have to come out and get behind that and influence people like you who have to make the decisions. Mr. Mayor, how do you respond to that? Um, I'm not sure where to start. I think there's some, some good points in there, but, um, you know, I just sort of, I think through the, you know, like I said earlier, there's an immigration policy that's a federal policy. We, we don't make those decisions. So, you know, at local, the local level, we're doing our best to try to accommodate the growth and doing it in the most livable way. We have urban containment boundaries to ensure that we're not eroding into our farmland and, you know, doing sprawl out of the valley, uh, those sort of things. Um, I think that the challenge that we have, though, the biggest challenge we have is around funding the system. As Jeff pointed out, we haven't had new operating hours into the transit system since 2009. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous that we haven't had new funding into the system. How can we expect to take on immigration growth? How can we take, you know, my daughter's going, going to move out the next number of years, and so there's two households where it used to be one, so it's not just immigration. Um, but how can we expect to grow and grow the economy, grow, you know, we have the biggest port by tonnage in North America here, which is important to the economy of Canada. How can we do that and not have federal and provincial investments into the, I'll just say, the overall transportation system? Except for uh, the Portman Bridge and the Highway 1, which 
One would argue that maybe it needed to be done for sure, but that was the tipping point to the North Shore. Right? The North Shore did a study um, that the increase, and it was about 4 or 5% increase in traffic when, as soon as the Fort Mayan Highway 1 project opened up, and that took those bridges over the breaking point. And now you have a parking lot on the North Shore. So it's that integrated approach to these things. We can't just be building a bridge, a rail line, a this, a that. We've got to think of it as a systems approach. And I, I want to point out, you're talking about population growth and we just can't sustain this, but a success story here in Vancouver is the population has been growing and they've been able to maintain the number of motor vehicle trips coming into the city centre and then increase walking, cycling and transit. It's a huge success story and I think that other places can take note, but you have to provide the other options. So there is room there for us as our population grows to make sure we have those other options. Question here. Hi, I'm just I hear about a lot of extravagant plans to build million dollar bridges and you know all sorts of different networks for everything. But I just like to challenge you guys to also think about some of the little things, like there's things we can do that may be small that might help with some alleviation to congestion. And you know, obviously we'll talk about my route home, because uh, that's what I'd like you to fix first. Um, but you know, you look at Kingsway, I mean, from three to six, you know, you can't park. But it takes everybody at six thirty to get home half the time. Like what if we just opened up another hour and kept that third lane available? Or, you know, like I said, I'm not an expert, I know you guys are, but um, you know, if there's something like the Stanley Park Causeway as an idea that would work on something like Kingsway, or go to some of those congested spots and take a look at what's actually going on. I mean sometimes it's right hand filters and left hand filters that can make a big difference. And if you look just up the street here, I mean I work at uh, up on Davy here, and you know Davy and and, and Barada, uh, especially in the summer when it's really busy, you get cars that are backed up, and then you get pedestrians that are crossing almost the full light, and then somebody wants to go left. So really, two cars don't even move until the light goes yellow, but five have joined the line, and maybe a little filter to go right, which are grossly absent in the city of Vancouver. In the little city of New Westminster where I live. We have left turn lanes everywhere, almost everywhere. Uh, roadway sensors that determine when the traffic flows. So if there's no traffic in the opposite direction, the light stays green. You're not sitting like you are in Vancouver at a red light at 3 in the morning with no traffic coming. So what I find, and I've lived here for 31 years, I find any bit of efficiency we do have in the burbs comes to a grinding halt at the first traffic light in Vancouver. And we all know Vancouver has this uh, agenda to reduce car traffic. What The car traffic isn't going to go away. How about making it more efficient on the existing roadways that we already have? Sounds like a better plan we got here. All right. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, and I love the question because I'm Greg, not Gregor. And <laughs> I'm the chair of the regional district that doesn't look after any road in the region. And so I can't answer any of your questions. In Port Quillam, I'm the mayor of there. We've got left turn lanes, all that synchronizing, all that green wave stuff, and, and all that sort of stuff. And, and we see all of it. So, question. Can't help it, sorry. But I, I appreciate your frustration because I've been there too. It feels your pain. So, so Does Metro not have any jurisdiction to coordinate no. with um, Mayor Robertson, for no. example. No, no. Um, he has an island. Uh, he has an island. Uh, yeah, and I have an island in Poco. Uh, and so does Mayor Cote in New Westminster. But uh, we do have the uh, major road network that TransLink uh, is in charge of and works in partnership with the local governments uh, to operate those and maybe to have other people. Yeah, and there is research to your initial question looking at how can we improve that in signalization and modernizing our signalization processes. Um, yeah, we do not have jurisdiction over that. We can help and we do matching programs with the municipalities. I can say from our own perspective, Clearly, we're concerned about traffic circulation, vehicle circulation, but we're also looking at people throughput. And that is something that as you come into Vancouver and you get more cycling and more walking and more grid network, becomes more challenging. I'm not here to explain the rest of it, but it is different than in the suburbs. Uh, we're about five to seven. How much longer are you guys okay? For Bring it. Okay, all right, here we go. Okay, uh, a little bit of a change. My name's Peter Holt. Uh, I've lived for 20 years in Surrey. I'm now 
Art Gibson's and Lee Spam. So I've used a lot of buses, I used a lot of bikes, I used to cycle 16 miles back uh, to, to work when I was in the UK. Uh, so I, I know you're paying those who cycle. My question is regarding for money. As you well know, the Evergreen Line has a very high price tag, and it serves a certain amount of people. Uh, the amount of money that's been spent in the region over the last, since 1986, is a very large amount of money. If you take Patrick Connell, the UBC professor there, he's made a lot of comments about the fact that the system we have is absolutely great for those people who live close to it, including in Vancouver. But we spent a fortune on a system that doesn't serve a broad cross-section of the community. Some of that money spent bike lanes, some of that money spent on a reuse of rail lines. Into River Line down south of the Fraser, goes all the way to Chilliwack, owned by the province. It was forced by Surrey, a actual uh, 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 report. They came out with a figure something like 40 million a kilometer or something like that. You know, yeah, that question. Yeah, natural fact, Scotland just put one in. Same size, loads of overpasses to Tenderley. Are we getting value for money, is my question, of what we're doing. We can't go back, we have to take what we've got now. But how do we get value for money for the future, for the transit money yet? I'll start on the cycling front because there's such a high return on investment when you put money into cycling and I do feel like it has been neglected in the region by all levels of government um, and I understand that the people aren't there using it yet but the reason why they're not using it yet is because the network doesn't exist and so I definitely empathize with what you're saying you know where is the return on investment that being said, I do think that the transit system is important and we should be maximizing it with land use and making sure the density is there as much as possible. So in the in the 10 year plan, uh, Jeff, you can correct me if you're going to get the numbers slightly wrong, but um, so we have the, the Arbutus uh, corridor, not the Arbutus, but the Broadway line that's going to go in. You know, that's 250,000 people a day are going to use that line. Uh, right now on that B line, 4% of the people that use that line are from Port Coquitlam. So even though it's geographically in Vancouver, that's a regional asset. Uh, and hopefully in, the, in whatever the next plan takes us all the way out to UBC and the 60,000 people that go there uh, every day. Uh, but, and then we've got the Surrey, and so that's more about servicing an, an existing need. But we know that Surrey and Langley is such a growing area. And if we can put in the, the lines there, we can shape how that community grows and do it right in the beginning, instead of trying to figure it out afterwards, which is really expensive. So uh, we're gonna shape a community by installing those lines. But I think one of the, the biggest, um, in my opinion, that wasn't talked about a lot, but one of the things that's gonna, I think, transform this region the most, there was 11 new B-line or better bus lines in this plan. So B-Line or better, like your 99 B-Line, your 97 B-Line. So they're a bus that uh, is usually articulated because it's higher volume. It goes usually every five minutes, and B -line, the 99 B-Line goes even faster or even more frequent. But usually every five minutes during peak, and maybe every seven minutes or so uh, off peak. Now there's 11 new lines like that that is going to make it convenient for people around this region to take the bus uh, around the region. I think the, uh, I think it's 75% of the people will be within a, a 10 minute walk of a frequent transit network. Is that right, something like that? Close. Close, okay, it's been a couple years. So, but, so what that means is, is 75% of our population will be able to walk 10 or 15 minutes to a bus that's gonna come at a maximum every 15 minutes during the service period. Right, so my commute home tonight, that bus would come in 15 minutes. If I just missed it, it's not a big deal. And the bus that I need to connect with, if I missed it, not a big deal because it's gonna come. That piece there is transformational to how we can use the transit system. The only thing I would add is that I, I don't think it's in uh, either or rail or um, this kind of service or streetcars. It's finding the right piece that makes sense. and. Really, we've uh, identified probably the extent of the major rail corridors in this region, at least for the next sort of 25 years, I would imagine, once we get through building this phase and through to the next, probably out to UBC, et cetera. And the then it's level. looking at a suite of things like Pitmere Moore is talking about is like really looking at high rapid transit, bus rapid transit kind of um, uh, tools that are much more cost effective at, at medium density uh, corridors. My name is Tanya Paz. We have an aging population, and if you haven't seen the figures, 
it's about to double and then double again in a short order. So that means that some of my friends I'm <laughs> sitting with tonight, maybe in 20 years, they won't have a driver's license anymore, maybe in 30, maybe in 40 years, mine will be taken away. So, um, and what I find ironic is the people who go to the open houses in Vancouver who are maybe the most angry about a bike lane are the ones who are gonna lose their driver's license way before I'm gonna lose mine. And um, I know that in the Netherlands, people with bad hips and bad knees find it easier to get around on an adult trike to carry groceries, et cetera. So how, what, uh, Mayor Moore, I guess Metro Vancouver, Hub and Transit, what are you working on towards this uh, big change we're about to have with an aging population? And, and how do you see that? How do you see that? Because we're, you know, they're in denial is what's happening. So how do we, how do we change <laughs> what's going on? How do we get people to that point? I like I'm with you now. <laughs> So I think uh, a couple things on that. Um, one, I think around the land use planning, you know, we're building town centers and regional community centers uh, so that people can live and work, or if they're a senior, live and recreate and go to the service and appointments that they need in their own neighborhood. Um, you know, we can look at, I can look at downtown Port Coquitlam and, and what we've done there with our seniors housing and our services sector. Uh, Coquitlam and Port Moody, I know, has done the same thing. So I think that's going to be part of it, is that you don't need a driver's license to get around. And if you need it, your kids should come visit you and you shouldn't have to go drive your kids sort of thing. Um, but I think on top of that, I think if we can build a transit and a transportation system that's convenient and safe, uh, not only for all of our population, but our seniors, um, that'll be a, a key to helping the mobility that they'll also need. I really like how you brought up seniors and cycling, and it's great to have talked with a lot of people that have mobility issues at all ages, and they find that cycling can be easier than walking. It helps them get around, and often if they can't drive, they can still cycle. Um, and I think what we're doing certainly is encouraging all ages and abilities cycling network. So that's from the youngest to the oldest, making sure that it's safe, looking at intersections in particular, which can be very troublesome, and raising awareness, making sure that people know that it's a viable option, making sure that they know that there are different kinds of bikes. There's bikes that you can step through so that if you feel uncomfortable getting onto a normal bike, it's a lot easier. There's trikes, there's electric assist bikes if you know that you can't put in that. Uh, extra amount of effort as you're getting older. So raising awareness, education, and then that all ages and abilities infrastructure. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at now are metrics around accessibility, and so we uh, try and identify the social services, whether they be hospitals, shopping centers, community centers, and do a sort of average what's the commuter accessibility time by different modes, either by driving or by alternative modes, and so that's one thing that kind of gets that when we're thinking about aging in place, are we providing really good options for people? On top of that though, we have to recognize to, that people are aging and that uh, mobility impairments mean that it's not always um, possible for people to use the conventional system, so we need to make sure that we have adequate resources into our access transit and handy guard. But when people are aging, that we're also doing a better job at walking to transit stations. We have an incredibly accessible transit system, probably the best in North America. But when we look at some of the impediments, intersections, uh, Washrooms are something that we're looking at. You're absolutely right. It's a big challenge. But making sure that people have access to the system, sometimes it's just those little things that cause a senior not to be able to get them. Yeah, question. Yeah, access to the system is exactly the point I was going to start, start with. And that, first of all, we've signed on both BC and Canada to two degrees Celsius. I say that would be great if all of the panelists could be part of recommending something like that. That's an example of something that has to happen. Thank you. Sure, I definitely agree that speed and other safety factors are a huge decision-making component and something that we would really like to see are 30 kilometer an hour local streets. So right now the default speed limit in most municipalities is 50. But if you're on a street that has no center line, there's no reason really why it shouldn't be 30 kilometers an hour. It's supposed to be local traffic only. And when they look at what happens in a collision at 50 or above versus 30, there's a huge difference in terms of fatalities and very serious injuries. It's something very simple that could be done. The province could give municipalities the ability to blanket those types of speed limit defaults. It would be 
very cheap. They just need to change the legislation, along with a few other things in the Motor Vehicle Act, um, which would make a really big difference in terms of making everybody feel more comfortable when knowing the rules, because right now it's very ambiguous and vague in a lot of ways, particularly as our transportation reality has changed a lot since the 50s when it was last uh, revised. So I think it's really important that we look at our legislation and awareness and how people are respecting each other on the roads that they feel that they can be out there in those modes safely. I think the other part that I want to highlight is um, I don't, you know, I haven't thought through what you said and to, to, to analyze it, but um, I, I was trying not to highlight or answer every question this way, but there was quite a few questions tonight that could be answered that we have certain authority as local government. The provincial government has quite a bit of authority uh, while we're children of the provincial government. Um, the road network, you got some provincial highways and you got some major road networks and you got some local roads. Um, some of the suggestions about Kingsway and the lights and all that sort of stuff, I didn't want to get into it, but it's not our responsibility as provincial government. So I don't want to blame them for it. That's just the reality we live in. Whether you're talking about a complete mobility or congestion pricing, the province has to be a big player in that because they own the big major roads. Uh, Transit has to be a part of that, local government has to be a part of that. Your suggestion, uh, absolutely the province has to be a part of that, actually has to lead that conversation. And so um, we, I think, what we're trying to do as the Mayor's Council in Metro Vancouver is to try to set the table and have all of the right people sitting around that table to have that kind of grown up conversation about what we need to do together and not let politics get in front of that discussion. That's easier said than done sometimes. Okay. Yes, sorry. Glad the previous uh, person brought this up because I'm, my name is Edward Cook. I have five young kids about two blocks from here, and we don't own a car, so we take transit and walk and bus everywhere. And the number one concern in our household is cars. So the first section of this, where we heard from a lot of people that want cars to move faster, is exactly the opposite of what I want as somebody who lives downtown. And my biggest worry is that survivability that Aaron highlighted that goes from something like 80% fatality at 50 kilometers an hour down to about 20% at 30 kilometers an hour. If you look at like Vision Zero, which we adopted apparently in May, but haven't done very much about. The Seattle and Boston have adopted it, and you see 25 mile per hour speed limits in Seattle and 20 mile per hour in Boston now. When are we gonna get that type of Vision Zero, lower speed limits in urban areas to make us as pedestrians, cyclists, and transit users feel a lot safer around large metal vehicles? I mostly already covered this and totally in support of what you're saying. The city of Vancouver has taken the step that all bike routes are 30 kilometers an hour, but they've had to sign every single block. What I'd like to see is the police enforce that so it's more meaningful and then add more. I Just at the high level, the challenge is that we're um, projected to adopt a million more people and to hit our greenhouse gas targets, even with the most aggressive electrification of the fleet, et cetera, we basically need to hold the amount of driving constant to what it is today. So all those new people need to be able to take different options, shorter trips, everything. So it's going to be two pronged solution, I think. Question. So it's lovely that you're talking about all the infrastructure that we need and, and you know, I, I applaud all these different modes of adapting our transportation infrastructure. But what I'm not hearing, and I know of all of you, Hub is the only one I'm going to applaud for this, is how are we educating people to diversify the modes of transport? How are we getting people out of their cars? What are you doing to educate the lower mainland's public to get out of their cars and onto their bikes and walk and, and car share and bike share? I mean, other than the private companies that are promoting their own systems and Hub that does a lot in that way, what are you doing? How are you getting the kids? Because the kids make recycling happen. Right? They taught them in the schools, and now that's why everybody recycles, because we bugged our parents to start recycling. Hub does a great bike to school program, but what are the rest of you doing to get people to understand that they need to diversify their own modes and to, to understand that it's the right thing to do? I think many of us are, are, I can't speak for every local government because usually that's the local government's responsibility and how they do that, but I think many of us are, are having those conversations. It's more um, what we're doing to create a safer uh, environment for your active transportation. Um, many of us have uh, the walking school bus program or 
whatever it's called, right, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, and so I think we're having the neighborhood by neighborhood, and it's looking different all around the region. We're not, I agree we're not doing enough. Uh, we do very targeted, I think, is we're pretty good at that. So at TransLink, we have a Travel Smart program that works with um, institutions and businesses. Obviously, we have a really good UPASS program that is kind of that in action. Uh, but we need to do more with the Evergreen Line coming on, on board very soon. We've been working in the Northeast sector to do travel planning with people to show how it's going to change their life how they can have new options. But I do think we need to do a much better job also pairing with other private mobility um, agencies, whether it be uh, Moto or others, on, on how do you actually use the system, what do your options look like. I'm really glad that you already know about that Spike to School program. And I want to put a plug in that we need to have partners like TransLink, the province, and municipalities to be able to deliver that. And it's not just about cycling, but it is about teaching rules of the road and rights and responsibilities so that kids understand how to be out there when they're walking safely, how to drive better once they get there because they've been on the road on a bicycle and they understand what it's like. So if we can get all the levels of government to fund that, like they do in many European countries, every child gets cycling education in school before they graduate. And so you know everybody knows that information. I would love to see that. Yeah, we're going to take uh, one more question. We're kind of caught up on time here, and I'm getting the rat sign. So, but I, I want to take one more question, and then also do a little wrap up with the folks up front. So, go ahead. Hello. It seems the biggest problem, which we have heard from you, is adequate funding. Now, there's no way in the present circumstance that it's ever going to be there. You've got the mayors have got to work harder to get the carbon tax out of general revenue, out of the premier's hands, and into public transit. Because other, that's just one source that could be really worked on. The other is attitude. If we want, the, for the needs of the citizens, we have to be prepared to pay for it. So quit this nonsense about taxes are bad, and it's only from the very affluent, the corporations, the rich, that you hear this. We need to have a livable GBRD. If we don't have adequate funding, we're not going to have it. And what points out the absolute kind of oxymoron about the way you talk so easily and know how difficult it is to raise money, you say, Pricing mobility. We have the poorest paid workers in the GVRD, more poverty in families in the GVRD. They've already been pushed out of the city because they can't afford to live here. So you're going to push them with having to pay for their mobility. Let's charge the people who are affluent enough to live in the city. Let's make it more equitable so that we all have to share in the cost of transit, not just the ones who've been unfortunately pushed out of the convenient bus line right off their back door kind of thing. Thank you. All right. So, uh, I think that was a lot of uh, I agree with everything you said. And the mayors, when we developed our 10-year plan, it wasn't just about a plan and an expense side of it, it was about revenue side. Our number one way to fund the plan was carbon tax. And we pushed hard, we pushed really hard. And in fact, this last go, and we were told no. We were told no, 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 no. And this last time around, we went to them and we discovered, this isn't really widely known, we discovered that uh, in the provincial government, they give every, the province gives everyone that lives outside of GBRD, Fraser Valley Regional District, and the Capital Regional District, a $200 a year carbon tax credit. $82 million a year, people outside of the Lower Mainland Valley and the Capital Regional District, $82 million. We said, cancel it. Because we're paying for your subsidy for, frankly, your votes. That's not the way that this should go. You want to keep it revenue neutral, as much as we might disagree, keep the $82 million here. That will pay for more than your fair share of the provincial government portion towards the mayor's plan. 
So that was the first thing that we did. Uh, around the mobility pricing though, uh, as Jeff pointed out, it's not about raising more money. We talked about uh, that it would offset the gas tax, so you'd reduce the gas tax, because that's not a good tool. It's a good tool to raise some money, but it's not a good tool to influence driving behavior or uh, policies that you want to try to implement. So we talked about reducing the gas tax and replacing it with the mobility tax so that you can influence how you use your road system so you're not spending billions of dollars building more roads and wider roads to accommodate it. And if we think that, we think that if you bring in the plan and you bring in some of those tools, um, it will be more affordable. And I think we did do some, Jeff, you can, I forget this one, but we did do research on uh, what it looks like from an affordability perspective uh, of once you implement this plan and how you pay for it. So I agree with everything you said. I think we could talk for hours on the wounds that some of us have from going through a referendum. We talk about, uh, we can send you the stack of no letters that we get from the provincial government when we bring these ideas together. And so I, you know, I didn't want to come here and just sort of crap all over the provincial government, but there's a player missing in most of these discussions, and it's a big player that has purse strings, has policy, has roads, has many, many of the aspects. And we sometimes feel, I think, like your frustration, that we're trying to, I don't know, push water uphill. Great, great, I'll crap over the provincial government. <laughs> that I very much, we... Hello? Um, it's the provincial government that controls the <laughs> <laughs> There's a sensor. There's I'll, a sensor. <laughs> I'll start cracking over the provincial government then. Um, it's a free freedom of being an academic, kind of. Um, but really, I think we don't really, in many cases, we don't have a funding problem. We have a priorities problem. And every time, frankly, if you step outside, you look to your right, somehow we can find half a billion dollars for a roof on a stadium. Are you telling me you cannot find half a billion dollars to fund anything else? It's that basic. And I think that very much if you not only, I think you certainly have to think about funding, but you have to think about your priorities, that coming this spring, you have a chance to change those priorities. And you take advantage of that. I hope you all come out the vote, and that's how you change those priorities. I agree. The, the issue of fairness and equity is going to be huge with this. And, and um, Mayor Moore pointed out that you know cities that take more transit pay less in transportation costs, just in general. And, and it's not about punishing some people that don't take transit as much, especially within this region. Um, most households have somebody that uses transit fairly regularly. Sixty-five percent of the population use transit on a fairly regular basis. So it's it's about providing options, whether it be for the kid or somebody uh, senior that's aging in place, but to be able to do so in a way that's much fairer and puts money back into household pockets. And I think that's what the approach the mayor's have outlined does. Aaron, we give you the final comment. Well, I want to just say thank you, Andy, for saying it's not about the funding, it's about the priorities as well. I wanted to say, you know, it's not always about how do you cut the pie, but can you grow the pie? And, it, and what is important to us? I think we can all agree that transportation is something we all rely on for our quality of life, for making our livings. And I feel like it has been bumped down, like it's some kind of third class thing that we're going to think about. I don't know what's more important. We all have to get places every single day. And uh, I hope that the provincial government comes to, or a new provincial government comes to, and understands that they can't withhold these tools any longer. It is a huge detriment to all of the modes that we're talking about. So uh, when you say the power is in the hands of the provincial government, it really is. And I never see them at these kinds of tables, at these kinds of events. And I think they need to show up, and they need to up that investment. Well, I'm sorry that I didn't get to everybody's question here tonight, but I do appreciate everybody that participated. I really appreciate the fact that you came here this evening. Uh, this is tremendous that I think that you have so much concern about what's happening, uh, about transportation and congestion and kind of the future of, of your region. Uh, we feel the pain down below in the, the lower 48, so we know what that's like. Uh, but I also want to say uh, thank you to the KCTS9 uh, Community Advisory Board, our folks from Vancouver, BC, that put together this uh, program. Thank you to the people here at Runhouse for this uh, 
great location, and thank you for taking the time to show. Uh, and please give a round of applause for our panel. And on behalf of KCPS 9, well, continue watching us, please, and support us. And uh, we'll have a podcast this uh, down the road here shortly. So thank you for joining us tonight. We appreciate it.